more somebody that you could connect with. So we have to have, we have to recognize that there's going to be multiple target audiences. So the target audience is a subset of the target market. So if we take a, a for example, take another example. Let's say that in this case our target market is still men. We want to sell our product to men. But let's say we identify different target audiences, not based on age, but based on race. So you specifically identified Asians, Hispanics, Blacks, right, as different target audiences. Those are large and reachable segments in the marketplace. <coughs> so we want to customize our advertising to create a commercial or a print ad that's going to resonate with that target audience, that's going to be relevant to them. Yeah, Shadow. Questions? We said there's three levels in a brand hierarchy. Corporate, brand, master brand, sub-brand. Toyota also has sub-brands. For example, for their Toyota master brand, some of their sub-brands include Echo, Corolla, Camry, Solara, Avalon, and they're all at different price points. Each of those products are unique. They have a unique bundle of features and benefits. And they're at different prices. So you can be at multiple price points. That's not the mistake that Mercedes made. It's okay to be at multiple price points. It's okay to be for Toyota between 17000 to almost about $40,000. But what Mercedes did was they wanted to be from 30000 to 130000 The brand can't stretch that far. Now you can, of course, they've sold a lot of cars at $30,000. Why is that? Based on what we literally just discussed in the last 10 minutes. Why were they able to sell a lot of cars at $30,000 that were branded Mercedes? Good, Constantine? Because everybody wants to have a Mercedes and they say it was cheap to sell as yeah. So more people realize that they're on a high quality car for the whole time. And so in <clears throat> marketing lingo, we would say it's a good value. How could you go wrong? A Mercedes Benz for $30,000. Remember we said that value is a function of price, quality, and benefits. Well, here you have a Mercedes Benz where the perceived, the perception is that it's a high quality, it has a lot of features and benefits, and now you can get it for $30,000. It's a good value. The brand name is only one of several branding elements. There's other branding elements. For example, the logo is a branding element. The symbol is a branding element. The tagline is a branding element. The packaging is a branding element. All of these are different branding elements. And it's within our power as marketers to define these branding elements. So we talked about brand name. We decide what the brand name is. And we decide whether or not it's going to be a name or a word that's in the dictionary, or we're going to create our own unique name we're going to create our own um, unique word. We decide what the logo is going to look like. The logo is a visual representation of the brand name that contains words. It's what we call a word mark. Whereas the symbol is 
a visual representation of the brand, but contains no words. So think about, for example, Pepsi. We all know what their logo looks like. It contains the brand name, but the symbol, which is that round yin-yang type graphic, contains no words. What's compelling about having a symbol is that without words, you could represent your brand literally everywhere in the world. So we can't be so presumptuous to think that everybody could read the Latin alphabet, that people could read the words Pepsi on the packaging. But that symbol, in over 100 countries around the world, people know that that stands for Pepsi. We need to keep in mind certain criteria in creating these branding elements. And there's four key criteria that we're going to talk about today. Four key branding criteria. So when we're creating these branding elements, there's these criteria that we should adhere to. The first of which is memorable. The branding element, whether it's the brand name, or the logo, or the tagline, it should be memorable. It should be something that people can recognize when they see it, that's going to make an impression on them. Another criteria is that it's adaptable. That means that we could modify or enhance or improve the branding element over time as necessary. Ideally, when we think about adaptable, we're thinking about a gradual change. So think about, for example, Betty Crocker, which is the personality symbol for that brand. If you go to their website, you could see a picture of Betty Crocker through the decades. And her hairstyle was different in the 50s than it is today. And the shades of makeup that she used in the 50s is different <laughs> than it is today. It's hard to believe that it's the same person, Betty. But it's been adapted over time. So yay for them. That's a really good example of where they've adapted their, a part of their brand. So they didn't have to scrap, you know, scrap it, start from new, right? They modified and gradually changed it over time. The branding elements have got to be transferable, which means that it's got to be able to transcend geographic boundaries. It's got to transcend cultural boundaries. So it can't be something that in one market is considered to be acceptable and in another market is offensive. So for example, the Pepsi symbol. Anywhere around the world, people accept that symbol. But take for example, when they first introduced Pepsi into the Chinese market. And they used a group of Chinese characters to communicate the brand name. And it's a phonetic translation. So it's pronounced Pepsi in Chinese. But this is the thing. The symbols, they're not letters. So whether it's traditional characters or simplified Chinese characters, they're not letters. They're actually representations of an idea. It's a phrase. It's a, a concept, each character. So although the phonetic translation was Pepsi, the literal translation was, we bring your ancestors back from the dead. Now, I think that's very compelling as 
a brand promise for an energy drink in the U.S. 